I sat there on my bed and I actually started to cry. And I started to think, is it really my destiny that I'm not meant to have what I want in my life? Is that really my destiny? God got these set of cards for me that I'm just not meant to have what I want. Is that really my sole destiny? Because the truth is, it's really not. Over the past few years, my life has completely changed. I've built one of Australia's most successful e-commerce startups, Happy Skin Co., generating over 10 million per year in sales and disrupting a billion dollar industry in the process. I've now turned my passion for growth and personal development to bring you these honest and eye-opening conversations. This isn't just a business podcast. This is about the person underneath. This is about the journey. This is what it's really like. I'll be interviewing guests from all walks of life, each with their own unique perspectives and experiences, from the hardest day of their life to the biggest accomplishments and everything in between. My name is Dylan Mullen, and this is Life, Money, and Love. All right, we're back. Another episode. Today, we've got Luke Hawkins. Um, he's, he's a multi-million dollar coach. Now, he's actually become the coach's coach, essentially. But what I wanted to talk to him about, I want to go through the whole coaching journey. But to me, from the outside, what I love about you is like you're the personal development king. Everything you've done to build up your businesses and yourself is all about personal growth and change and changing who you are to becoming the person you want to be. And then once you've done that for yourself, being able to teach other people how to do that. So that's why I'm so interested to talk to you. But can you let everyone who's listening know a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, certainly. So I was a school teacher and doing that for a number of years. And, you know, I had an ex experience where I was in a school for kids that had been expelled from other schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, mix that with kids that had autism and, a you know, ADD, Asperger's. Yep. And, you know, and so it was pretty much fireworks in a school. And so one day I was me and this one boy and, and he, uh, you know, it was just me and him. And I said, oh, is he going to be all right to, you know, just me and him to, for me to teach him? And the head teacher said, yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> one boy. <laughs> um, so I went into the room and, you know, went to, you know, say to him, you've got to do your work. And he goes, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. I went, oh, okay. I said, no, you've got to do it. He goes, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, oh my fuck. so I thought I'd do something smart and I closed the door. Yeah. And then the next thing I remember was him walking over the top of me. <laughs> so he threw in a chair at me and knocked me unconscious. Damn. Um, and so I got rushed to hospital. And then from there I was sort of like, shit, do I want to keep being a school teacher? And so, yeah, from there I, you know, had that and I had a relationship breakdown and, and from that experience, I had quite low self-esteem from these mm -hmm. experiences and I uh, didn't want to be around at that time and thought, what else could I do? And I got into... Uh, you know, learning essentially life coaching and work these tools on myself mm -hmm. to transform my, you know, negative emotions, clear traumas and emotions and, you know, limiting beliefs about myself. So I started into becoming a life coach yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and then I learned these tools and went from there. Because as well, with that, I've, I've read somewhere or I heard on a podcast, you spent a year and a half in Argentina before that? I did. What was that like? Uh, interesting. I, I went there to learn Spanish. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I went there to learn Spanish, but uh, I had a, I also was a uh, you know trained personal trainer, yep. And uh, but I had a big fear of that. And so when I ran out of money, I started you know, becoming personal trainer and running group fitness classes in. Yeah. What, yeah. So when, before you started, I want to know what's going through your head when you kind of, when, once I hit rock bottom, but you're there, you've had that failed relationship. As you said, your self-esteem was low. Why was it coaching for you? Why did you decide that's going to be the path I'm going to take? Yeah. I, I was really interested in uh, like why people do what they do. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when, why did people, why did someone produce that, that behavior? You know, why did they lie to me? Why did, why do people cheat? Why do, um, you know, people act the way that they do. And I was always very inquisitive about that. And I would work with people as a personal trainer as well. And, and I could see like you would tell them to lift the weights or whatever, do yeah. the squats, but then they'd go out weekend and completely destruct themselves. <laughs> so, you know, that, um, you know, I was just really interested always in, in helping people. If you yeah. had a problem, I'd be like, I want to solve that. Yeah. So that would be me. Cause your first course was uh, like if the first thing you did as a coach was helping people how to quit smoking, right? I did. So, and you took a sign out and just went to random people on the streets. I, I did. So you don't have all the social media stuff that people talk about now, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, cause I did a course and then someone said, look, if you're really hungry and serious, you're going to print off a bunch of flies and yeah. you're going to hand them out. So I did that where I grew up on the central coast, yeah. an hour and a half North of Sydney. Um, yeah, I would hand them out and go into doctor surgeries, uh, you know, where else I go, pharmacies, yeah. um, hairdressers, and yeah, it was interesting. 
And how, how does that work? How do you quit smoke, like get someone to quit smoking in like 60 minutes or whatever was the... Yeah, 60 minutes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so some people like they would have the habit for like, you mm -hmm. know, 10, 20, 30 years. And I would tell them that I can get you to get rid of this habit in 60 minutes. Yeah. And they'd be like, you're full of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'd be like, no, I really can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the main thing is um, basically your, your, your habits uh, and what you link pleasure and pain to mm. um, is actually stored in the subconscious mind. Okay. Yeah. So that is what's controlling 90% of your behaviors. I'm very interested in unpacking <laughs> this because I've spoken to a lot of people about this and definitely we haven't had anyone who actually understands the science about this more than you. So I'm interested to, to hear about it. And is this all kind of related? Obviously your most, the, the, the thing you're most famous for is NLP, right? As yeah. a, like an NLP yeah. coach. Is this all linked to so NLP? So I or? started off learning neuro-linguistic programming, mm -hmm. right? And all that's just a bunch of set of tools that you can use to, you know, essentially they started as reprogram, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it comes from like every thought, feeling and behavior is essentially like learned or created by yeah. yourself. So, you know, if I learned it, I can unlearn it. Mm -hmm. So I started with that and also hypnosis as well. Um, but basically the how you can get someone to change really quick, the, the strongest force that controls human behavior in the nervous system is your identity. Yeah. And so that is like, if you say to yourself, I am a smoker, right, then you will produce behaviors consistent with that identity. And so if I could change your identity uh, <clears throat> from being a, uh, a, a smoker to I am a non-smoker. Yeah. And people struggle to give up that behavior because they say something like, oh, I'm trying to quit. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you could say that identity, but then I can get you to visualize things and, um, you know, imagine things to associate massive pain to doing that okay. habit yep. at a subconscious level. So is this like going back to like anchoring, like you can use anchoring in like a positive and negative way and motions to derive a certain outcome? Or? Yeah. So what anchoring is, is like basically, um, you know, it's, it's setting up a, a trigger to, for you to respond in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right. So for most people, when they trying to give up smoking, for example, they think of a cigarette and that uh, is an anchor or a trigger for a positive feeling. Yeah. Right. And that comes from a set of beliefs that they have and, you know, a, a set of values that they have and, um, you know, things like this. So you can change the anchors or change what the emotion is that's tied to that, 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 that thing. Yeah. Cause let me ask it this way as well. I've got a friend who, who you know, Joe, that he's extremely disciplined with diet and training now, but there's one thing that he can't give up and it's vaping. And he's never uh, been a smoker beforehand. It's only the last couple of years. And the one thing, his <laughs> lifestyle is so clean and disciplined when it comes to exercise and diet. But there's one thing, like he'll buy a vape and I say, well, why are you still vaping, bro? Yeah. And he'll throw it out. And the next day he's bought a new one. Like he'll buy a vape and throw it out. I want to quit, but he can't. What, what, could, like, what would you tell to him to be able to help him flip that one bad habit that he can't seem to get rid of? Yeah, it, it's really um, – some habits are actually have a, an emotional root cause to them. So there can be a variety of things. But one thing it can be because there is uh, – people can use these things as a way to – you know, process their, you know, emotions or unresolve emotions from their past yeah. or, you know, where they're living now emotionally. Because the only reason why you do anything is to change the way you feel. Yeah. You know, you, you do something because of the feeling you believe it will give you. So I, I think some people, it can be something unresolved emotionally. It can mm -hmm. be in their past, right? Or, it can, you know, it can be a stress or something like that. But, you know, for him, uh, the easiest way to change is really to think about what is the worst negative consequences for me, you know, um, what does it cost me in the past and in the future, five, yeah. 10, 20 years in the future. And that's how you make change a must. Yeah. We've like, that's, that's, that, that's really interesting. We've tried to do these things as well. Like we'll, we'll all have these little goals or things we want to change and we'll put these negative consequences on them if we don't, but we don't follow through with that. So the behaviors never change. So I think like, if you're going to do something like that, I think it's important to be consistent and not be so flippant with it, which is, I feel like some people can tend to do, okay, if I don't achieve this, I'll do this and they don't achieve it. And then they give themselves that excuse and like, oh, next time I'll change that behavior. Yeah. So the change isn't a must for them yet. Yeah. It, it's a sure. One thing that I can't understand as well. And I, I don't know what your take on it. You work with people with all sorts of, you know, starting from the start versus people that are already extremely successful. Yeah. But I can't understand sometimes. And I, and I, I know I don't want this to sound like an arrogance thing for me. It always comes back to, because I'm not, in the position where you are, I don't have that NLP tools or whatever else, you know, yeah. to be able to help give people the tools to overcome it. But for yeah. me, it's always like, if you can't change it, you don't want it enough. Yeah. Look, 
there's a way to get people to change who even don't want to change. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, but the, but the, like you have to use what's called leverage. Yeah. And so everybody um, has things that they value in their life. And we all have a need to avoid pain and gain pleasure. So if I associate enough pain to any behavior, mm. um, I, I, you know, if I turn the stove hot enough, so to speak, you put your hand on a stove, it's, if it's kind of like a little bit heated, you're not going to take it off. Yeah. Right. But so you don't have to hit the, you know, painful consequences yet, or really be what's called, you know, um, towards motivated. Yeah. You know, you, you, you could, you know, imagine what those consequences would be, but yes. And still they do need to make a decision. Yeah. Okay, I want to go back to something you said before as well when we were talking about like the the power of identity and like the most powerful words like in the world and the ones that follow is I am. Mm. I am. Tell me about your thoughts on like the power of identity and how you can use that to to change your future. Yeah, I think whatever comes after I am is is going to be <coughs> the future that you create. Mm. And a lot of people struggle to create a new identity in their mind because they, when they go to change their behaviors, they or change their identity. The first place they look is their past. Yep. And if they haven't done it in their past yet, or, you know, had that past references, um, then, you know, it's very hard to change a belief for some people if they're only using their past evidence, yeah. you know, to tell, to give them feedback that they, they can change that belief. But that's only one way to change. Like if you've done it in the past, but you could visualize it, right? That's the second like an easier way to change your belief, yeah. actually, like just Roger Bannister did, did that. He was the first person to run a four minute mile, right? Under four minutes. How did he do that? He actually visualized running that 400 meters under my, uh, you know, uh, that, that mile under four minutes, yeah. you know, over and over again. So that's the second way you change a belief. But the third way, um, which I used a lot to change my identity because I came from, you know, small town, central coast. Um, most I earned in a year was $25,000. Um, and then year one, I went from 60 K year to hundred K mm. and then year three, a million. So, and then it went up from there. But how did I do that? That year thing is I did these things called, uh, incantations. Okay. And that's where you were, you know, most people in affirmation, you'll say it to yourself, oh, I'm happy. I'm happy. Oh, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. But if you don't emotionally feel it, then your subconscious mind is gone. This is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> so to get over that, you've got to say the identity or say the beliefs, repeat it to yourself, but with emotion. That's yeah. I, I would, I would agree with that 100% because I'm a big believer in like the law of attraction and I use yeah. visualization every single day. It's part of my morning routine. It's been part of my life for probably 10, 15, since I can remember, but I only realized it like consciously maybe five to seven years ago. And then once I realized the power of visualization, when I was anchoring those visualizations into emotion and when I not just anchoring it into an emotion, okay, when I'm going to visualize this thing, I am completely there experiencing it. When I was able to, to do that and let that emotion come out, that's when I felt like I was the biggest, most powerful magnet in the world drawing these things to me. But then at the same time, I'm also filling myself up with that energy and that belief. So then whether or not, if you believe in the energetic pull of the universe that I'm pulling that in, I myself, I'm now fired up, I'm sharp, I'm ready to go. And I'm creating that positive motivation in myself by doing that anyway. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good to, you know, see it, hear it, feel it as if it's already happening mm. and you can energetically embody, embody it as well. Yeah. You were talking about just before, like some of the, the year one, year two, year three, mm. let's go back. Let's talk about that business journey and how you've been able to grow such a successful, successful coaching business from someone that when you started, you didn't have a lot of money in the bank and you got to go out and tell people how to change all these behaviors and how to become rich yourself when you hadn't no. In reality, technically done it yourself yet. No, no, no. It was the hardest thing because, you know, I was, I actually went out and approached random real estate agents and they, you know, I would go in there and tell them, you know, I can help you to, you know, make more money, improve your finances. And around the corner was my thousand dollar van that I parked around the corner. Um, you know, but for me, I knew the power of identity mm -hmm. and I knew the power of saying to myself when I had nothing that I am a world-class coach. I am, you know, the best at creating change. I can change anybody's life, yep. you know, right? And I will do whatever the effort it takes to do that. So I, I walked in. Now, when you go to influence another human being, if there's rapport, right, I, a feeling of similarity between two people, whoever is most certain will lead that conversation. Mm. So a lot of people, I knew their beliefs, where they were coming from, for many people, they're coming from past experience. Yep. So if they don't have the past experience, that's why people stay stuck because they're trying to um, look to their past, to, you know, but it's the wrong place to look. But I knew the power of visualization and I knew the power of giving myself this identity now. So that's how I walked in and was able to 
to do that. Because if you're looking at the past, how are you ever going to create a life that you've never experienced Never before? done it before. So you go, oh, fuck, I've never done that before. So how could I now? But you're looking in the wrong place. Yeah. Right? You've got to say, like, no, my future is what I say I am today. Yeah. And that's very powerful, yeah. And then saying, I am already these things that you might not be. These these might be goals you want to be in the future, but you say, I am the, I am this today and behave in that way. And before you know it, reality is going to catch up to what's inside your head anyway. hundred percent. I said to myself, I am a millionaire mm. with living at my mum's house and, you know, earning $300 a week as a school yeah. teacher. What was that catalyst of change for you? Was it a book? Was it a course? What was it for you that yeah. just flipped the switch in your, in your mind? <laughs> yeah, I was always interested in uh, Tony Robbins. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I was always very interested in him. So a friend of mine gave me, uh, you know, a pack of seven CDs yeah. from him, actually. Old school. Uh, yeah, it was um, called The Ultimate Edge. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, so I started learning about uh, what he was doing. I'm like, oh, shit, like, that's awesome. Yeah. And did you attend any of his courses or anything? Yeah, so I started off, uh, I slept in my van to do the UPW one in mm -hmm. 2015, mm -hmm. about September. And then I I listened to his biggest, uh, the pitch for his biggest program. It's called Platinum Partners. Yeah. you got to pay 100 grand to get this yeah, thing. Yeah, wow. right, right. But I had nothing at this time and I listened to it. People were like, why the fuck are you listen to that? Like, yeah. like, you can't be there. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, we'll see. And, and so I, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's why I like, I visualize it. No, I went all the way. I've been coached by Tony personally a couple of times. Yeah. That's yeah. epic, man. And with that as well, people say, oh, you won't be there. It's, I feel like, do you ever get hate for people calling you, oh, you're so arrogant, Luke, or you're so cocky to believe, but you, that you need to create that belief in yourself first. Yeah. I think a lot of people uh, struggle with is, yeah, is really the judgments of other people and it's, it's really because they judge themselves if, mm -hmm. if they were to do that behavior themselves and because sometimes they've had generally past negative experiences from that behavior that they judge. What about growing up, high school, primary school, were, were you the confident kid or did you experience a level of bullying like a lot of people does? Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely, like, growing up, like, I was not the cool kid for sure. Yeah, yeah I was, like, I tried to be. <laughs> 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 um, you know, but, you know, I was like, oh, why can't I get the girls or whatever, yeah. you know? And, uh, you know, I, my year 10 form, I remember going there on, on my own. I didn't yeah. have a date, you know? Um, you know, so I, I wasn't, like, you know, I, I wasn't smart. I wasn't mm -hmm. intelligent. My, my parents tried to get me to work hard. Mm -hmm. So I just got into uni with just working really hard, but just yeah. barely, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. I actually want to see what your thoughts are here. You mentioned yourself a little while ago that like so much of what we do is anchored in like our experiences and past traumas and things. But how do you go from that? And that's something you believe, but you seem not at all limited by the life you had before. How do you be aware of that? that, you know, these traumas and all these things that are into your subconscious affect the way you are today and how you behave and say, no, no, that's okay. That's cool. But I'm going to become this person anyway. Yeah. I think you have to see like what direction are you really headed in your life? So for me at 27 years of age, I'm 35 now, mm -hmm. um, living in my mum's house. Um, <clears throat> and I thought to myself, like, if I'm getting one day a week at a school and I'm 40 years of age and I'm here at my mum's house, like, you know, I don't expect any, you know, woman that I would want to be with, want to be with me, <laughs> right, under those circumstances because, um, you know, it was one day a week and then I was hating my what I was doing. Yeah. So I was really depressed and I, I'm like, I'm not going to make it if, if I keep. So that's why I, I saw the pain, the, the train that was coming for me. I, was, I don't think I was yeah. going to last. Yeah. And it's just a decision like wherever you are in life, like all you need to do is make that decision that you want better and commit to it and then you can have it. But it's like making that decision and committing to it. Yeah, I think I talked to a lot of people as well, and a lot of people uh, they would rather you know this this comfort that mm -hmm. it's it's not it's like the frog in boiling water. It's like you put the frog in boiling water. If it's not that hot, then the frog you know uh, you know just stays in there. And so people are, might be in this warm. It's not too hot to jump out yet, yeah. and it's not too cold to jump out either. So they will just settle for this comfort that, you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's, 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 it's enough. It's, it's, it's not bad enough for them. So why do so many people tend to play it safe? Look, th there's different human needs that drive human behavior. Uh, and so if we call them as six human needs, right? And the first human need is the need for certainty or comfort. It's a human need. So we need to feel comfortable that our survival needs can be met and, you know, that we can feel comfortable. Right. But the second human need is the need for variety. So that means you have to experience change. You know, variety is the spice of life. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to experience change in your emotions and variety. The third human need is the need for significance. So you need to feel important, like that you matter. And then the fourth human need is need for love or connection. We all have a need for 
connection and love is human need. And then the fifth one is growth. We all have a need to grow, otherwise we're dying. And the sixth human need is the need to contribute. So if you don't feel you're contributing to life, you're going to, if you're not, then you're going to be eliminated, right? So you've got different needs driving human behavior. And for most people, the top two needs that are driving them are actually certainty slash comfort yep. and significance. And, and how do you, Not growth. <laughs> you know, how do you help people start to make that shift and actually embrace change? I know me personally in life, I thrive on uncertainty. If I knew exactly where my life would be in a year, two years, three years, that's for me, that's death. That I, I'll start to shrivel up. That is not how I function. Yeah. How do you start to show people that change and an element of uncertainty and unpredictability in life is actually the most exciting part? Yeah, it, 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 you know, I, I think if you can give people an experience, like they should do other things that, that maybe are smaller steps that mm. are uncertain. Like, you know, don't actually tell people to quit their job tomorrow and then just try to find an idea. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I think they should experience things that are new that they normally would avoid. Yeah. And I heard this powerful quote that uh, courage is not, uh, is, is not acting without any fear. It's acting in spite, in spite of, of the fear. So you still fear it, but if, but you act anyway. Is this like a step-by-step -step process? Like you would start with something like small and then yeah, gradually build up to something yeah, bigger? Yeah, that's what I think so. Because mm. most people are, you know, they, they need to have, you know, gradually get there, I would say. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to, to your business journey as well. So let's paint the picture first year. How much? You said 30 I did 60,000. 60K in the first year. Yeah. And then the second year? Was 100. When when did you first start to really make that shift? When did you hire your first employee and really start to build this traction? Yeah, my first employee was when I went from the 100K to the million. Yeah. Yeah. And that was when I hired so my first guy. From 100K to a million was the next year? Yeah. Yeah. How did, what, how did that leap happen? Uh, uh, well, I was seeing a lot of one-on-one -on -one people for mm. the first two years. So I think I mentioned, like, you know, I've seen people for everything. Like, yeah. you know, I've seen people for phobias. I've had them for 30 years of what well, you name it, like getting in lifts, spiders, birds, um, you know, syringes. Like I can yeah. get rid of phobia in like 20 minutes. Yeah, right. Wow. So, but yeah, so I saw people for phobias, addictions, weight loss, quit smoking, uh, you know, just self-esteem, confidence, business coaching, whatever. Uh, but so after I, I was, I saw all these people, hundreds, hundreds of people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And I thought if I keep doing this, then, uh, you know, I'm going to help people individually, but I'm not going to reach as many as I can. Yeah. So that's when I went to one to many and I started seeing groups of people. And uh, yeah. And so I had groups of people. I was teaching them tools to transform their life and train them on how to become a life coach as well. And with that as well, what was the thing that in terms of, okay, that change, how did going more technically in terms of business sense, what mm. did you do in terms of marketing to ah, yes. be able to get in front of so many people, to bring so many people into your community? And once you bring those people in, you got the referrals and it will start to obviously grow naturally as well. Mm. Yeah, because the main source for me started with referrals. Referrals. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have to be good to get referrals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, to get it from 100 to a million, uh, I would say that I was – I used to do actually three – when Facebook algorithm was better for Facebook lives, mm. I used to do three Facebook lives a week yep. and I used to do those and I used to um, actually coach a lot of network marketers. So yep. I would do Facebook lives in network marketing groups and there would be hundreds and even a thousand plus people on these calls yeah. and they'd put me on as the mindset expert. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the, I was doing some, you know, you call like joint ventures like that, mm. like sharing my knowledge and I did run some paid ads as well mm. that I, that started to work for me. Cause you've been through it all. Like, you know, how fast social media changes, the algorithms, more of these platforms change multiple times a year. And like what you did a year ago, two years ago, there's a pretty good chance it doesn't work now. What's that? How have you been able to react and continually to stay on top of these changes to ensure that you can still get your message out in front of people and then bring leads in to be able to help change these people's lives? Yeah. I, I think you've got to be learning from the right people and, mm -hmm. and seeing, you know, what is it that's working and, and, you know, you know, who is it the best in your field? Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer of modeling and modeling is finding those people who have already achieved what you want mm -hmm. and finding out how they did it and, well, their psychology to emulate that. Uh, yeah. But I, I think, you know, with you've, you've got to learn and try to find people that have already done it. I do try some trial and error. Mm -hmm. Like we ran YouTube ads for a while and then now we run Facebook ads all the time and yep. whatever we book like 40 or 60 calls a week from me and the sales team. Uh, you know, but you've got to, you know, not give up. Like I think people avoid learning skills like marketing. Yeah. Well on that as well, 
you've, you obviously run a multi-million dollar coaching business, but how much money have you spent on yourself in, in coaching courses, personal development Yeah. over the years? What do you think? Ballpark? No, no, no it, it, it's over a million. Yeah. That's mental. Yeah. But it's what it takes, man. It's the most valuable investment you can make is an investment in yourself. Yeah. I've spent over a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. I've like, you've seen the all, like we did Gary Vee mm. and I've done Grant Cardone, Tony Robbins. I've done a whole bunch of other people. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I, I've, I was always hungry to learn mm. and I, I, and I never bought my own excuses as to, you know, why I can't invest in something, you know? And what's that decision like? When was the first big course that you did when you didn't have a lot of money that you're like, this is like 90% of my personal net worth right now and I'm going to invest this in this course? Yeah, the first one was the first coaching training that I did. Yep. Um, that's when I spent every cent. But then there was a second level to the coaching training mm -hmm. and that was uh, $8,000 and I didn't have $8,000. <laughs> <laughs> so I borrowed uh, I was lucky. I went to my mom actually yep. first and I said, mom, could you please lend me this money? Yeah. And she goes, that's, that's sickening amount of money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, you can't, you know, you do that. No. And then she went out and went out and ran out of the house and said, go away. Um, but then I was like, I sat there on my bed and I actually, um, started to cry. Would yeah. you believe? And I started to think, is it really my destiny that I'm not meant to have what I want in my life? Is that really my destiny? Is like God got these set of cards for me that I'm just not meant to have what I want. Is that really my soul destiny? And that's just shooting my son as I say that, mm. because the truth is it's really not. And so I realize that and I'm like, no, if I want this enough, I will use more of who I am mm -hmm. to get this. So I pulled my mum back inside and I sat down and I like cried in front of her. I said, Mum, please give me just even the deposit. Please. And she looked at me. She says, you know what, Luke? I said, I will pay you this back. I will pay. But she's like, you don't have any way you're getting one day a week at a school. There's no way you can't physically pay this back unless mm. this works. And I said, I promise you it will work. And she's, I believe you. She goes, all right, well, I'll give you two grand. You can ask your dad for the other two. And, um, you know, I didn't have a good relationship with my parents at that time. So it was a lot of um, shame for me to ask this money. Yeah. So, but I did. And then I did sleep in my van um, to do that second course. And I knew that this is where I start, but it won't be where I finish. Did you have that level of certainty already or was it just the seed? I had a, a trust in something greater than myself. Mm. I think, uh, I believe business is also a spiritual journey. Yep. And, and uh, I have, a, you know, a, a faith and a trust in something greater than myself. I, I think that you're taken care of when your intention is to serve something greater than yourself. Mm. And that realization that you had at that point when you asked yourself, is this what life is meant for me? I'm just meant to be the guy that doesn't get to achieve what I want to achieve. Is this really my destiny? Yeah. I think I've reflected on that myself. Mm. And like I, I've always been like a massive daydream and I've always thought about the future and who I am and what I want to achieve. And then I remember thinking back at a certain – like all the way through like my teens, my, my childhood, I always had really big goals and dreams and aspirations. But I had this like – part inside my head that was like, your dreams are so big. Who are you for your dreams to get to come true? Why do you think you're so special that you get to do exactly what you want to do? And then a little bit later in life, when I started to like open myself up more spiritually and like learn, go deeper on things like the law of attraction. And then especially when I started the business and I started to taste that little bit of success for myself, I realized, dude, you've been looking at it the wrong way. Like, of course I can make my dreams come true. We all can. That reality, like, no, sorry, that like that thought, once you can fully comprehend that and fully believe it, your life is different forever. If everyone can understand that you can make your dreams come true, it's the most beautiful gift you can give someone. Like, because then you don't need to be perfect every single day because you trust the journey. Mm. If you trust, like, same thing for me. I, I trust there's some sort of connection with some sort of higher power or connection to the universe where I know I have a destiny and it's to, to achieve these sorts of things and I might not know exactly where the end Got like the, the end moment is, but I know I'm on the right path. And I know if I keep exploring myself and exploring purpose and backing myself, that beautiful things will happen to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important. Like they say, the two most uh, important days of your life is the day you're born. And the second one is the day you find out why, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I think it's like, it's going to evolve mm -hmm. as you evolve because some people say, you know, what is my life purpose? You yeah. know, what is my purpose? And people will, you know, will get really you know, stressed about that, but it's going to evolve as you evolve. Absolutely. And so I, I believe that, you know, you, you should really see like, what do you really love? What, mm. what are you really passionate about? 
And obviously business wise, what does the market need and is there yeah. demand for it? But yeah, if you don't have that passion as you have mm. for your business, I know extraordinary of the growth that you've had, you know, you couldn't have built that if you didn't yeah. have your passion, right? And with that as well, this is, and this is applic applicable to, to coaches that come to you, but this is also makes sense for everybody out there who are looking to find the next direction in their life. They might be in a job that the corporate job they don't like, or they just feel stuck in life. If someone comes to you and they say, look, I want to start a coaching business. How do you help someone find their niche or how do you help someone find a really good place to explore and try? Yeah, I think that's a good, yeah, good point. Good question. Uh, for many people, uh, you know, for, for when it comes to niche, either you must, I believe you must know, uh, you know, how to solve it. You must know it or even better. It helps with your relatability story as you're sharing it. If you've overcome it yourself. Yeah. You know, so I started with quit smoking, but I'd never smoked a cigarette in my life actually. Yeah. I definitely drank, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, so I, I started with that, but then I evolved, you know, I, I helped myself overcome my past trauma yeah. and the things, you know, I was down and depressed and very low about myself. So I started to share that and that's how I got clear on yeah. mine. But I, I really believe that, you know, the market, there has to be, you know, I say step number one, that you know, there's, they've got to have the money to pay you that mm -hmm. target market, homeless people, you should give money to not be your client. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And then ideally that there's a big enough cost to the problem. That's the second step. There's a big enough cost to the problem and they're in enough pain about the problem. That's yeah. the second step. Third step is a big enough market for that niche. Mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be a big enough market. And the fourth step I believe is that you have solved it yourself, or at least you know how to solve it. And step number five, you're passionate about it. Yeah. That's how I help the coaches get clear on it. Yeah, I really like that. One, the, the biggest thing for me that I like whenever people come to me for e-com and think, okay, I want to start a, 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 a brand. I don't know what sort of industry or product to focus on. I say, look, there's a lot of things that go into it. E-com's a little bit different. But the main thing, if you want to be successful long term, is try and make it something that you're passionate about. Because as you know, with business, it's not going to be e easy every day. No. There's going to be so many days that you got to turn up and deal with problems that yeah. you don't want to deal with. There's going to be sleepless nights, as you know. So if you can anchor, anchor it in something that you really care about and interested in, that's for me, the direction I want to take my life is exploring those sorts of things. But you can't forget about those other things as well. Like there needs to be a problem that you're solving, whether it be a coach or whether it be a product for e-com okay. that needs to solve a problem. You can't just pull out a like thin air and be like, why isn't this working? Why aren't people giving me money for this? Like the market will always be. Yeah. You know, it always measures the success, the market. Yeah. yeah. You have to consider that because if it's, you know, if you're passionate about something that just, you know, that there is no demand or need or problem for, then, you know, it will be a harder uphill journey, I think. You just mentioned um, you were like down and depressed yourself at one point. And then mm. talking about that journey was actually how you could relate and, and, and like mm. people wanted to hear about that. How do you go now? What's the best way that you've been able to find to help people overcome their own trauma and depression or anxiety? Look, I think a lot of people, they've got to know that you have had a, a lot of, you know, experiences in your life that you, you know, that if you're honest about it, you probably still have negative emotions about those things that have happened in, in your life. If you think about them. Okay. Right. For many, for a child, growing up as a child, you know, for example, like there's going to be times where you did not have your needs met <laughs> yeah. for very often for the large, large majority of people. Yeah. And everyone's had relationship breakdowns. Everyone's experienced loss. You know, you don't meet a human being in the street that has not experienced loss. Mm -hmm. So that is what is, generates, you know, you know, emotions of trauma, like sadness or hurt, you know, so everybody's experienced these things, but you, you, you have to be honest with yourself about, you know, um, <clears throat> that you do feel this way. Right. And then you have to ask yourself, all right, well, how do I want to feel about these things that have happened in my life? And so that's where I believe you, you have to find a lesson or a, or a higher purpose or higher meaning for yourself as to why that had happened. Mm. Right. And loss is, is a perception, right? And we know, you know, in, you know, quantum physics or whatever, that there is in the universe that everything has a positive charge and a negative charge. So everything is always in balance, right? But people get depressed because they're looking at only the negative side of life or that event. And they're not seeing the equal opposite positive that is there. But you can't, for every loss, there is a gain, but you have to look for it. Yeah. I love that. And that's the, something that's helped me through life a lot. I'm, I've, I'm someone that's always hated, uh, 
like failing and like not doing well in something and, and that serves you in a certain way and then it becomes a hindrance at another point. But wh what I realized was one of the most powerful tools that allowed me to exponentially grow at a rate that I hadn't done before is realizing it's okay for, for things to go wrong and to make mistakes. But the thing that helps me get through these, whether they're big things or small things, if I can find the lesson in it, then I use it as a positive and mm. it changes my state completely. Sometimes I'll, f I'll fuck up and I'll do something that I shouldn't have or you know what, I'll, 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 whatever it may be, I'll do something and I try and find the lesson in it. And this specific, particular thing might be so stupid that there's no lesson in that. So what I've actually done in my life and it actually, it's going to sound weird. I don't know. Yeah. But what I do is, okay, if I've done something stupid and I regret it and it's caused a negative in my life, whether it be small or large, and there's no specific lesson in that, what, okay, I've done that. Now, because I've done that, I'm going to make myself do this unrelated, unrelated thing that I wouldn't have done if I didn't make the mistake. So now, even though it wasn't related, I wouldn't have had the, I made myself have the idea to do this positive thing, which ended up being a positive in my life. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I overcome it. Because otherwise, if I don't, if I, I it, as a human, we tend to like dwell and dwell on these problems. Yeah. And sometimes I needed to pull myself out of that and I couldn't find the lesson. So I'll actively make it a positive thing, even if it's unrelated. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I, I think the people underestimate the power of asking themselves the right questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when things happen in your life, I, I find for me, when something negative happens, I like to ask myself, you know, how, how can I use this to help me and, uh, you know, create something, what I really want in the future. And what is positive about this? Yeah. If you look down the track, you can try to see like, what is positive about this? It's probably um, protected you or, or prevented you from experiencing something far worse Yes, <laughs> down the track. Like you're like, fuck, if, if I didn't experience this now, um, I'd probably experience this pain on a much grander scale. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen and, that. and sometimes as well, sometimes as well with that, you don't always realize that something might go wrong in your life. You might not get a particular opportunity that you wanted. And then six months down the line, you realize, wow, there was actually a beautiful reason why that didn't You can see why. Yeah. You've got to like, oh, I can see how this would, how this would help me down the track. Yeah. yeah. Now, something I've spoken to you a little bit about before is like one of the hardest things in business is hiring and building out your team, right? Oh, yeah. How many employees are you at now? Like, uh, we, we have eight now. Yeah. And that journey you've gone on to hire and find people, I'm sure some hires have been amazing. Yeah. Some maybe not, not as, um, uh, well, you know, effective, maybe, yeah, right? Yeah, you just can make to be honest. On the road, yeah. What what have what have your learnings been there in terms of like finding and hiring the right people? Because in your niche, this isn't like a, an accounting firm where like showing up is like your your true self and being a positive, you know, a positive like person to be around while you're trying to change lives and part of a coaching business is so important. Yeah. What have you learned in terms of hiring and finding the right people to build your team? Uh, I, I think I like to use it as like a triangle thing. Okay. So, yeah. So the triangle thing is the first thing when you, when you're hiring is, you know, uh, what is, what is this person's genius and what are they, what are they, what is a genius and what do they love? Right. So that's the first part of the triangle. Like what is a genius and, uh, what do they love? Right. And the, the second part of the, of the triangle is, you know, do they have the, um, the skills or the experience, uh, you know, or the knowledge to do it. So, yeah, skills, experience, knowledge. I think that's mm -hmm. the second part. Like you can have people that are great that don't have the past experience, right, but then you've got to, um, you know, allow for that, that growth phase, right? But then down the bottom is, you know, um, what are their personal goals? And, you know, um, and are their values aligned to what you want as well? And, you know, and, and I think, you know, do they have those, those traits that you're looking for? So that, that's how I like to break it down. You know, if you have someone that's like, it's their genius, full, bl full blown, that they're really great at what they do, but their personal goal is they want to make a million dollars in a day. I'm like, I can't pay you a million dollars in a day. So it's not going to work. It might be someone's, uh, you know, they might be really loving you know, whatever the job that they're doing, but if they like for a salespeople, for example, like I might hire a salesperson, they really love sales, right? But if they don't have the experience or the skills, um, then it's a long road. Yeah. So I've in the past not fully understood people's, I think, personal goals enough. And being able to, yes, that's so important. Under like having that conversation to understand what their personal goals are, and not separating that from the business, bringing them on 
on that journey and thinking, okay, how can I, whether you're going to be with us for a year, three years or five years, how can I help you get towards that? So I'm serving you. And then while I'm helping you do that, obviously you're going to be adding value to the business and then it's going to be a win-win relationship rather than I'm just trying to milk you for, to make as much money for me as you can. And then you're going to be unhappy and you're probably going to leave and do a poor job in in a few months anyway. Yeah. Like I, I just hired someone recently and, you know, and I'm now I'm very like open up front. Okay. What, you know, for example, if it is financial, what is it that you're wanting in, you know, a year or two years or three? And I want to have that conversation now because the thing is with our industry as well, my industry, like I'm all day on repeat yeah. saying that, <laughs> that, you know, you can conquer the world. Yeah. Uh, you could climb mount the mountain and you can, you know, become a millionaire. And the reality is it's extremely difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, so they're hearing that all the time. And so I've had people like, it's only been a matter of months. They hear this from me all day, every day. So it's like, you know, if I've helped them become a better person and find that path, great. But generally I like to see people, you know, to get them to see that this is a marathon. Yeah. I yeah. Think. You just mentioned sales there. I, I imagine in your business, it's important in every business, but communication and sales is yeah. very important. What's your like take on the sales process? I know you have a team now, but if you were doing the entire sales process yourself, how do you generally approach these conversations when you know you're going to, a particular course or program might be charging a lot of money, but you know, there's a lot of value in that. How do you navigate that and not, and not sell out of a, a place of like negativity where I'm like, I feel bad for asking this money. How do you approach that? Yeah, I think that you have to have absolute certainty of the value of what you sell. Mm. So if you don't have certainty that this is more value than what you are asking for financially from that other person, then you probably are going to consciously or subconsciously uh, sabotage yourself. Yeah. And, and I use the metaphor, it's like if someone was starving in the desert and they had their last $1,000 uh, and you had the last bit of food to give them and, you know, and, and you knew they needed that to survive. You, if you would say, give, give me your last thousand dollars. Here's the food for you to stay alive because mm. you absolutely certain in the value of that. And I think people struggle with, they don't see enough value in what they have. And, and, and that's a struggle for people. So I, I, I liked people to see that, you know, what is the negative consequences if they don't use our product or service? Mm. It's got to cost them far more than what I'm asking for. Mm you know, in other areas of life. It doesn't have to be just financially, but what is it going to cost them in their health, in their relationships? You know, if someone doesn't do a course with me and I don't transform the relationship with themselves and they don't believe they're worthy of the relationship that they want, like what value do you put on that? Like those sorts of things are priced. Okay, like <laughs> what value do you put on your own happiness? Yeah. If you wake up depressed every day, like is what is that worth? I don't know. Like I, I think it's immeasurable really. Like yeah. so you I have seen that for myself. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I understand sales and communication really well and how to influence another human being, right? But number one, you have to start with the belief in the value of it. Yeah. And how do you navigate the naysayers and the hate that come along with being a public figure like you are? Uh, I think uh, people will say things to you like, oh, you're just in this for the money or, you know, um, you know, or you, you, it's only about yourself, you know, things like this. People will project onto you the things that they actually deny or don't accept in themselves. So you've got to know yourself and know why you're doing it. Right. And, and I know that like we give 10% of our profits. It all goes to Operation Underground Railroad, mm-hmm. which is a charity that helps free kids from human sex trafficking. And now tell me, I like your notion on like why giving and systemizing giving to charity and other yeah. things like that is so important. Can you share I that? I learned that off Tony. Okay. Yeah. 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 So Tony uh, actually gives 10% of his profits to, yeah. to at the time when I did Wealth Mastery. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and uh, yeah. And so he did that. Um, and he's like, the reason why, and he went, went, went in the room, he said, the reason why you, if you didn't do it, the reason why you wouldn't do it if you're sitting here right now is because you have this fear that there is not enough. Mm. And there's two approaches to life. I believe that you either believe scarcity mindset that there is, you know, you, there is not enough. You fear there is not enough. So that creates a taker mentality or you have an abundance mindset. And that is, there is more than enough. And so my belief was if I give, then the universe or God is going to reward me because I'm serving something greater than myself. And that energy will come back around. And how do you go from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset? Like you've, you've got to stop, um, you've got to start appreciating what you have. Like, what do you have that is great or that is positive? It might be a dollar in your account, but someone gave you that dollar. 
And so I think you should appreciate what you have and, you know, and know the truth that the universe is abundant. Mm. That is the truth. So if you choose not to see that, that's not the truth. That's your mind. And, and we live in an abundance world. There's a lot of money going around right now. Yeah. There is a lot. And so I, I just choose to see the truth that there is more than enough. And if I give, I'm going to be taken care of. So it's usually a belief system. Yeah. And even, yeah, 100% agree with you. But even like the phys, like how good you feel, if I give, if I give to charity or do something to charity or do something to help someone, even though it could be taking X amount of my time, the feeling that gives back to me, even though we don't do these things for a personal yeah. payoff, the feeling it gives to you is is worth it in of, of itself anyway. Well, they've done studies on happiness yeah. and they found that they, they found the happiest people are actually uh, one of the biggest traits is that they are givers. Yeah. And it, it, it releases dopamine in the nervous system when yeah. you give. Yeah. <laughs> now, another thing you just spoke about, relationships. I know you've, you've run many masterclasses and workshops and relationships. What mm. are some of the main challenges or problems that you see come up when navigating relationships? I think people, number one, uh, starting off are not clear enough in what they want in relationships. Mm -hmm. They don't know what their ideal relationship would look like. Yep. So I say to people, create a list, right? If you are single and, you know, you want to find the person that you really want to be with, then I believe you should create this list, right? On the list should be, first of all, what um, must be there? Um, in, you know, in this relationship and this person, what should they be like emotionally, um, spiritually, you know, what are they doing in their business or career? What are their interests? Um, what would you share together, do together? And so that's like, you know, describing that ideal relationship and then what must not be there? Well, then maybe they must not be a drug addict, <laughs> yeah. right? So what are the must nots that are there? And then the, the third step is like, who do I have to be? Like, I think people go into relationships, you know, you know, I need to find the right one or what do I need to get mm. from this person? But I think you should ask yourself, who am I going to be? Yeah. What do I want to give to my next relationship that allows me to ask for what I truly want? Yeah. I was going to ask a lot of that work, I imagine comes from the work you do with yourself before you get You have to have an extraordinary right? relationship with yourself. Yeah. You know, you cannot have a deeper relationship with another human being any deeper than it is with yourself. Yeah. You won't allow yourself to receive from another human being something that you haven't allowed yourself to receive from yourself. And how much of a role does confidence play in that? Well, I, I, I think uh, confidence is important, but uh, underlying, I think, for a lot of people, relationships, it comes down to worthiness. Uh, and, th and that is you believe that you are worthy of receiving the love or the type of relationship that you want. And if you don't subconsciously believe that, you will block that out. That's why people stay in relationships for years and years and years because they don't believe they're worthy of more. Is there any tools that, that you give to people to like get out of that place where they don't – like they may have a pattern of going for toxic partners because subconsciously they feel like that's what they deserve? Yeah, they do because one of the reasons as well for that is what's called this concept called trauma bonding. Okay. And trauma bonding is where if you grew up as a child and your experience of love was to um, feel this lack or not have your needs met or not be treated the way that you really wanted, that was your experience of love. So then you go out in life and you subconsciously um, look for that because that's what you're, that's what's familiar for mm. you. We seek what is familiar in this. So to transform that, uh, you know, you have to start uh, really getting clear on what you want, what you consciously want. And, and decide to, that is a must. It's not a should. It's a standard that you should have. Yeah. I think relationships are a very complicated, like <laughs> a very complicated thing. Unless for me, the only thing that I've been able to like is finding the right person has changed it all for me. But right. for me, it was just hard to like, it's that balance, like finding someone I had to first step for me was I, I knew who I was. I knew what my purpose was and my, my goals were. I wouldn't want to change that f for anyone. Yeah. And once I was okay and sure with who I am as a oh, person, beautiful. only then was it going to ever work with somebody else. Yeah. I feel like so many people go into relationships with the goal of the other person to be the one that brings them this happiness mm. and brings them the life that they wanted. But you, you can't put that pressure on someone else. You need to show up as a whole person. They need to add to that. But going into a relationship, I see so many people that will bounce from relationship to relationship to relationship looking for this gratification and worthiness mm. in that relationship themselves. But it, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah you won't f find it externally. If, mm. if you don't have a way to meet your own emotional needs internally, you know, then you're going to be depending on that person. The minute they don't meet your needs – um, the way you want b because you have no ability to meet them from within yourself as well, then, yeah, you that's how people jump from one to one.
Now, now going back to you, obviously the work you do requires a lot of energy. Mm. How do you continually fill up your cup with energy and motivation to be able to do this every day? Yeah, yeah. I, I think exercise is an important part. I'm now training uh, solid three times a week. Uh, doing that, I have a personal trainer seat twice a week and I do one on my own. I'm very big into, uh, you know, a few supplements and things like this. Yep, yep. So I, I, I drink a lot of water. Like I'll drink at least two liters of water a day for sure. I add Himalayan rock salt mm -hmm. because it's got uh, these um, essential minerals in there, yep. which are really good. And I've been taking this thing a lot called uh, Life Cycle. Life's, is that the uh, mushroom? The mushroom extract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah mushroom and um, extract. So, yeah, I found them really good. Uh, and, uh, you know, I take other powders and things yeah. like that, you know. But, yeah, I'm really interested in, in you know, being able to nutritionally look after myself. Yeah. And what, what's your morning routine like? Uh, well, this is interesting because it's evolved uh, yeah. quite a lot. Okay. Um, yeah. So I used to take a while to get into state and to mm. get in a positive mind frame at it because my mind was so negative. Okay. So I had to start up and meditate. I had to stand in front of the mirror and say powerful things, but I haven't had to do that anymore. Actually, mm. the honest truth is, is, uh, w when I wake up my first, um, meeting or session will generally start at 7 a.m. Yeah. So I, at the moment, I'm actually waking up, you know, it'd be 6.30 or quarter to 7 a.m., uh, quarter to 7 in the morning. Uh, but then I will be working at this stage. I, I am working quite late. I am working until about 11 at night. Yeah, and how, and how much, how important is hard work to that journey? I don't want to be the, you know, spruiking like hustle culture, <laughs> like hustle culture, like everyone looks down upon, but to be a successful coach, you speak to all these people and sometimes like they might have the right mindset. They might have... A, a, a good framework for the course, but how much does that hard work actually influence the success of a, of a coaching business? I, I think that when people grow in their business journey, the way that it starts out is at the beginning, you're going to put out a lot of energy and you're probably not going to receive that energy back immediately. So there's like a lag time in the universe, right? So, you know, I, I've found this, you know, to the, the speed at which you change, right, s something and to the degree at which you change something, that determines how fast that energy comes back. Yeah. So if you do a lot of work in a short period of time, that energy will come back faster. If it's spread out longer, then it's going to come back, but it's just going to take yeah. longer. Yeah. So energetically, however you look at it, hard work or hustle, like if you're taking action, which is putting out you know, energy into the universe, the more amount that you can put out in the shorter time frame, the faster it will come back. Even let's look at that in terms of how much content you put out. <laughs> how much is it in like how much content are you putting out now? Okay, so we're doing two reels a day. Yep. At the moment we uh we have just started now two TikToks a day. Yep. And we have uh one to two YouTube videos a week at the moment. Uh podcasts will be one to two a week. Yep. Uh and then uh Facebook business page, LinkedIn, you know, that will be uh five posts a week. And so and then we have a couple emails going out as well. Yeah. So every week. Now, did you get to a point, like, did you find a sweet spot was like when you upped the amount of content you were putting out that you were getting X amount of leads back was, does that, does the amount of organic content you put out directly influence the amount of leads that will come into your business? No, not always because there's two types of marketing, okay. right? So the two types that I, the way that I teach at least is you've got value added marketing or content marketing which is this, right? Which is great. And then you've got direct response marketing. Yeah. That's where I ask for your, your name, email, phone number, <laughs> you know, in exchange for a piece of value. Yeah. The first one you give the value for without giving it, asking for anything. Yeah. Right. So you've got to have both. We do both. Uh, but definitely the first one value added or content marketing mm -hmm. is, you know, the most powerful way to build know, like, and trust with your audience. Yeah. So what's your business model like now? I know before COVID you were doing a lot of big in-person events. Are you getting back yeah. into that or where are you guys at at the moment? We, we want to do more events. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we, 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 I want to down the track. I'm just waiting for this election to be over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what the fuck's going to happen there? Um, it was just no predictability in, in yeah. decision making there. So that's yeah. like, you know, I, I actually paid for an event and then, you know, the, you know, Someone, someone caught, caught something. So, <laughs> <You can go. laughs> so they, they shut the state down again. So, but, uh, you know, now we're doing virtual. Yeah. Yeah. So doing, uh, you know, everyone's tuning in from around the world mm -hmm. and yeah. So that's been really powerful. People learning online. Yeah. That production setup that you guys have whenever you're doing those yeah. events from, I don't know if it was like your old place or whatever, was. but how did you guys set that up? That is so 
well done. Like the production Thanks. value and the organization in that, I look at that and I think far out. Like that's how much it takes to run these events. Oh, um, my meeting girl will be really happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brock, yeah. No, he's great. Yeah. yeah. So he sets it up, the two TVs there. We've got two big cameras, like yeah. 4K cameras. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and then we've got the lighting and mm. whatnot, you know, but we want to give people an experience. Yeah. So, yeah, that we, we pride ourselves on having the best virtual experience. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. One thing as well, I want to wrap up soon, but I want to get your take on like yep. the education system, the traditional education oh, system yeah. and, and what do you think about that? Look, I think the problem with it is that it, it teaches you only how to be an employee rather than, you know, how to, you know, create something for yourself, mm. right? So that's one part of it. I think the other part of it is we're not spending enough focus on developing the self. Okay. I think that a lot of your, you know, the quality of your life, I believe, is the quality of where you live emotionally yep. and the quality of relationship you have with yourself. And I just don't think there's enough focus on the relationship with the self. It's, yeah, man, I, I, uh, I heard a podcast that you, you, you were on um, and you said like you'd, you'd prefer to be able to homeschool your kids. And yeah. I just think, I don't know if I'd want to do that, but I do not want to put my kids through traditional schooling. Like I want to look at things like Montessori and that sort of learning, just different ways because the way I feel like I'm quite lucky the way that I went through the, the school, the schooling system. And then it was only until I got out of school and I tried the law thing. I went to uni, I tried yeah. it and I realized this is setting me up to be unhappy and depressed for my entire life. I was lucky that I realized, fuck this, I'm not accepting that. I'm going to do it my own way. And then from that point, I've been able to realize the full potential of life and like, okay, instead of learning all this stuff that fucking isn't going to influence our life in mm -hmm. any way, why don't we explore what we're really good at, what we're interested in and try build our life and skills and potentially a future off that? Yeah. I, I, the, the problem is, is like your school results are based on how well you remember, remember what they told you to remember. Yeah. And, and what they told you to remember is, is, is actually a very small <laughs> yeah. percentage of what you'd actually fucking use. Yeah. Right. And so I was a school teacher and for some people it's mm. right. And I'm not saying to people that sometimes it's really right thing for you to work with someone else. Like that mm. can be the right path for you. Right. It's just that, you know, if, if the, when people go out, they don't understand finances. They don't understand taxes. No. They don't understand, you know, uh, how to, you know, find their passion or their purpose and, and things like this, or they don't, they've never learned marketing. Like you've never learned marketing, you, you know, in the way that it's used today, you've never learned sales. You've got to become learned to become a great salesperson. Like all the time you're selling sales is influence. Yep. Can I get you to believe what I believe? <laughs> yeah. Right. If you don't learn how to do that, then you, you know, you're constantly under the influence of everybody else. Mm. And b by no means am I saying everyone needs to want to start their own business. No, no, no. That is the, that mm. is not at all what I'm saying. I just mm. feel like the way that they drill information into everyone's head is not the right way to go about it. Like people like we're going to need people to, to, and, and people do like my cousin's an accountant, a finance manager. Yeah. He absolutely loves it. There's a place for mm. everyone in, in this world to do things that they enjoy. And I just think putting so much pressure on kids, like I've, I've, and done some consulting with kids that are like 18, oh, yeah. 19, 20 that have made a bit of money drop shipping. And they tell me like, I was so depressed after high school. I thought I was an idiot. I thought oh, I yeah. was dumb. Or because your learning style doesn't fit in with this way. Like how long ago was the schooling system? Like this syllabus and the way they teach people, it's hundred years old or whatever. It's yeah. not. And the rate of change, how much the world changes every year with technology and social media it's so different. Yeah, yeah. You're going to get eaten alive mm. it, when you leave school now. If, if you do that, you're going to get eaten alive. And so that's why for me, like, yeah, I, I, at this stage would prefer in my environment. The problem is when you put them in other people's environment is, you know, they, they are, when your, your brain between zero to seven years of age, mm. everything that is said to you, your brainwave is in sort of like a theta brainwave state. And that brainwave state is where you are the most suggestible to yeah. everything that you hear. And you don't even question it from zero to seven years of age. Yeah. And then when you get from seven years to, you know, 14, 15, 16, there's another uh, stage of your life where actually you're, you're looking to, you know, fit in. You're, you're looking to find your place in the world. And, you know, and, and that's when you're so easily most influenced by your peers as well. So, you, 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 you know, I saw the schools where there was kids that, you know, they'd all come, many of them from a low socioeconomic background. And so they came from a lot of abusive backgrounds and they wouldn't even bring books to school. Mm -hmm. And then I taught, I did a prac at King's School for Boys here where they're paying, you know, 50 to 70 grand a year to send their kids there. And different world, right? Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, 
who you spend time with from even a young age is is, yeah. is so important. Well, that's so interesting. Like I um like I grew up in like a, a, a lower middle class family, so I went to public schools the whole way. And I in year eleven I went. So I'm like, okay, it's year eleven and twelve. I'm gonna take school seriously, right? So I went yeah. to a like a private Catholic school for. I was meant to be for year 11 and 12, you know what I mean? I went there and I was there for – genuinely all my friends laugh about this. I was there for like three weeks mm. and I was straight back to the public school because I just felt like, oh, just – man, I'm not so much of a fan of like boxing everyone in. And like I, I came into this school and the teachers looked at me as I was the public school mm. kid. I didn't tuck my shirt in, right? They could see I had marks from where I took my earrings out. Like they would just pick on the littlest things and I realized, nah, man, I, I, can't, I can't live with this. I'm going to go back – be in a beautiful, supportive environment with teachers I loved and like all my best friends and sure, like there'd be kids smoking in the toilets at lunch yeah. and stuff. But I feel like being able to navigate those sorts, sorts of situations and different people from all different backgrounds. Like we had such a multicultural school. So we had this thing called International Day where like we would have all sorts of foods from different, like everyone would like bring in foods from their culture. They'd be like, they'd be like, like, There'd be like an Indian section. There'd be like Asian. There would be like all the Islanders would have their food. Like there'd be Australian, which is like sausage scissors and stuff. Like yeah, right. there'd be all sorts of stuff, Macedonian, European, all that sort of stuff. And we'd come together and experience each other's cultures. And then in the afternoon, we'd have like an assembly, which is essentially like everyone will put on some sort of show connected to their heritage, whether it be a dance or a song or something like that. And I feel like being exposed to all sorts of different cultures and people and ways of thinking and doing things was one of the best things about my school. So I, wow. I appreciate that so much. Um, Incredible. yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing now. Yeah. I don't know what I'll do when I have kids. Like I said, I'm, yeah. I, I just know I don't, don't necessarily want to put them into like a black and white, you know, this is, this is the box you got to live your life. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. The, the more you can grow yourself and be, you know, the example and the leader of your own life that you mm. want to be, I think the better you're going to yeah, mm. be, we are for our kids. Now, where are you taking this? Like, what's your dream? Like, what's what does success look like for Luke Hawkins in this look, coaching business? Yeah, coaching business. I, I well, we've trained seventeen hundred people from around the world. Now, uh, we did that, and we, you know, have the number one training company for coaches now in the country. Uh, we have the most successful students. We have over one hundred and twenty of them that are doing six figures a year. Uh, I've got at least twenty of them now that are doing seven figures a year. Wow. Uh, and then I have a couple of eight figure students. I have one guy that runs, you know, the biggest property company in the country. It's nine figures a year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he did my course. He's gone massive now. He's yeah. got like over 200, 300 staff. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. He did my stuff. Um, completely blew up. Went from 3 million to a hundred million within a, uh, like two years. Three yeah, years. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But, um, so from now anyway, what I want to do, my, my ultimate goal is to put, you know, down the track, like definitely like hundreds of people in, in, in my events. Yeah. Then I also, biggest thing would be thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a long road. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I live for seeing people transform and we have this coach course now called neurotransformation therapy, mm -hmm. which is essentially the latest tools that we teach for transformation and change and helping people to master influence, communication, sales, leadership, and really understanding human behavior, like why we do what we do, which I think is just, you know, essential. And then we have the social media business trainings for coaches as well. So we just want, you know, I would love thousands of people in these events and, you know, I want to create a wave of coaches that are helping to evolve the consciousness of humanity. Yeah. That's what I believe in. I love that. And do you think you've found your purpose? I believe so. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. I, I, I feel for myself, like I really believe I'm, I'm here to help heal other people and help to create massive change in this planet and also to evolve the conscience of humanity. Yeah. I'm a big believer of removing fear from people's minds and I never want that to let that stop that from myself as well. So that's what I believe in a lot. I love that, bro. And where can everyone find you? Uh, great. So probably the easiest way is they can, you know, on Instagram, it's at Luke Hawkins is my Instagram handle. And also YouTube, you know, at Luke Hawkins and the, probably in the website, Luke, uh, Luke Hawkins dot com. <laughs> yeah, it's super easy. Like, man, I watch so much of your stuff and there's so much value just in those little like 15, 20 second little reels that you put oh, up. Thanks, there's so much value in that. And like, oh, okay, like you'll be doing a dance and stuff to, to get on trend. But like, they're so simple. There's so much information out there. And that's why I'm such a fan of the coaching space and this like education is there's so much education out there yeah. and we can now learn about the things that we really want to learn about. We can learn the, about the most important thing, which is how to, in my opinion anyway, how to become the best version of ourselves. So I'm super appreciative of your space and I think it's epic. I think more people should should do it and, and grow and, and push themselves outside their comfort zones and start figuring out what do I really want to do and 
what sort of impact I want to have on the world. So thank you for, for doing your part in that space and giving us your time today. Really appreciate it. No, nah, thanks, bro. Really thanks, bro. Awesome. Thanks for coming in, man. Awesome. All right, there we go. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, could you please do me a quick favor and hit the follow or subscribe button? I honestly appreciate it more than you know. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.